We have about two things on the shelf that never got made that I loved very much. We wrote a four-hour miniseries from uh, The Source, uh, from, and it's quite wonderful. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's such an exciting project, you know, it, it traced the layers down and started with very primitive uh, people and then moved up through. It was just marvelous. The main characters are Israelis and Arabs. What it says is that they are really deeply related and they really belong together, though they can have differences. Uh, that is not a, a viewpoint that at the moment is that all that popular. I think everybody is scared to do it. Although, you know, it was a best-selling book. I used to go on airplanes and everyone was reading The Source. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a really popular book and it's a wonderful book to do. So that one sits there. I don't know if it will ever be done. Another one that sits there is a movie that I was to do with the Soviet Union. Uh, where it was to be a co-production of Moss Film and MGM. And uh, they sent me over to Russia. I stayed there in Moscow for about four weeks. I worked with fellow, uh, the director who was to be and all of that. They were wonderful. I had a great time. I came back and wrote a very good screenplay and the Vietnam War started. And M MGM pulled out. They were scared to get into a project where they would be partnered with Moss Film and who know what would happen. So it sits there. Every now and then I take it out and read it. I like it. But anyway, would you what's what I said is what I said, though. I love doing it. It is not a lost, it, it is not a lost part of my life, just as the source isn't, because I love them. If I had done it and really just done it as something to do, I'd really feel robbed. <laughs> but the fact that it sits on the shelf, it's more, it still it has been an experience for you. Oh, yes. All that I learned is in me, and I can bring it out in any other way in my life or in my work. If I ever work again, if I ever get to the typewriter, to my new IBM typewriter. Well, the writer's role is always, I think, um, one of the hardest roles there is in the making of movies because it's the most important, at, from my point of view, and the least appreciated. I always think that the writer and the editor who work by, alone in a room, not on the set, nowhere near the set, are not appreciated because it's as if somehow it, it happens and anyone can do it, you know. But everybody else is out there where you see them and they are the ones who are more appreciated. So I think that existed even back then. Uh, the role has changed, I think, in some respects. Writers are making more money than they ever made in my day. My goodness, uh, their, their salaries are now astronomical as are stars. Uh, writers are stars in many cases, uh, which I think is fine. Why not? Uh, but it, and, and I think writers' work was rewritten and, and tampered with as much then as, as today. Although if you formed a relationship with a producer or a director who respected you, you had less chance of getting your work, uh, you know, vitiated uh, by uh, people who came on afterwards uh, to uh, give it an edge, or whatever they say today. Uh, I don't know that it has changed all that much. There's a statement that's ascribed to uh, Irving Thalberg, which may be apocryphal, I don't know, but they, he is supposed to have said, the most important person in the making of a movie is the writer, but we must never let him find out. <laughs> I find writing hard. There are people who love the actual act of writing. They love doing it. They love sitting down to do it. We write in different ways. My husband wrote on a yellow pad with pencil all his life. And we collaborated a lot there. He was scribbling on a yellow pad. I wrote on a, 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 a portable electric typewriter, small portable electric typewriter. But, I, but it is not 
great fun for me to write, except when you get about three quarters, well, maybe 60% of the way through, and you really now know your characters, and you kind of are pretty sure where you're going, then it gets to be fun. Uh, up until then, I find it quite difficult. I had friends, Irving Wallace, the you know wonderful novelist, who used to say, I can't wait every day to get to the typewriter. And I thought, oh my God, he has to be kidding. <laughs> but there are writers who feel that way, who actually love. I find what makes it difficult for me is that writing is full of choices. Shall I go this way or that way? Shall I take the character here or there? Should I use this character or that character? Should I? And choices, even in our personal lives, are not easy. So uh, in our professional lives, they are just as hard. So I find that difficult. But my day, you said, how do I spend my day? I get up and try to think of ways to avoid writing. That's the way I, I, I have as long a breakfast as I can manage. I make a lot of lists. Lists, 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 lists. I go and straighten my closet a lot. I do all mechanical things I can think of, and if I'm lucky, three quarters of the day is gone, and I don't have to write that day. Anyway, I do fight it, I have to admit, until, and meanwhile, though, the mind is working. I have an idea or whatever it is uh, that I'm to be writing now, and the mind really does not shut off. You, you do it, I dream it, I wake up in the morning thinking of it and all that, but fighting getting to the typewriter to put it down, there's something about that act. And I think I may know partly what it is. Maybe this will have some resonance for some of the young people who might see this. It's lonely. When you go in that room and you shut that door, or leave it open but hope no one's going to come in or, or pray someone's going to come in, but it is lonely. And I'm a slow writer, laboriously slow, so that it means six or seven months of my life at the least of sitting and, and in that room by myself. And I think of all the wonderful things that must be going on <laughs> outside. I, I live on the beach and the highway is there and there will be cars having accidents on the highway that I'm missing, <laughs> people drowning in the ocean, <laughs> all this great stuff that I am <laughs> missing <laughs> because I am sitting at this typewriter. So I fight it as long as I can, but then comes the moment where I have to sit down and do it. And then, I, if, you, if we want to talk a little bit about, I have all these, <laughs> sometimes weeks, of, uh, of fighting it, I have evolved some, some parts of the story I know and some development of the character I know, though I've not written a word. I used to, early on, try to do an outline. And I would sit and try to make an outline of the whole movie. And I found after a while that that wasn't good for me. First of all, because I never stuck to the outline and I felt it was inhibiting. Oh, I don't want to do that, I want to do that. So I began to feel I shouldn't do an outline except it was in me. But I would start by writing a scene I loved that I knew wherever it was in the movie. I didn't care if it was at the beginning, the middle, of it, and it was something to give me confidence that I could write in this story. So I wrote that scene and I looked at it. By the way, I'm a big chain, I, I write very sloppily. Michael wrote neatly. He wrote on that yellow pad and he, it was almost the, just exactly, we would give it to our secretary to type and it would be just the way he wrote it. I would write a line and then by the next line I decided that one didn't work, then I'd have things that went down here, X's. My, the secretary spent hours transcribing mine. She did Michael's in 15 minutes. There are people who find it very productive to show a friend, a fellow writer, 
someone they trust their work and get a little, you know. Uh, uh, I felt that I, I, the only one at this point I had to please was myself. And I was a very hard task mistress, a task mistress. And I, I really uh, just worked to, uh, to make it something that I liked. So I would, uh, I would just write what I felt I could write. And after I wrote enough little pieces, began to have a kind of cohesion. And then I said, well, I got to make that. I got to fill that in. Now, when I first started writing, in the era that I first started, we did a lot of exposition. The big comment you used to get from your producer who read your, your, the draft you handed in, do they understand that at the beginning? Are you sure that you they understand what's going on so that, and so you'd go back and you'd do more exposition. After a while, I found that very onerous. And there was a period when British movies that those that great series of Saturday night and Sunday morning and all those movies broke all those rules. They they didn't dissolve anymore. They didn't use any of that. They cut right to another scene, and you'd say, "Where am I?" And then in a few minutes, you'd know where you were. It was so freeing, so exhilarating. I thought that I embraced that, and I just uh, uh, you know let. Let the, the thing grow as I felt it, as it, as it happened, as I, as I thought it ought to be. Well, I always let it be known up front that I'm a writer. I always say that very much because I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the Guild. I, I was at the Guild when the Guild fought for a lot of the things that we take for granted now. We take for granted that we have uh, 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 pension, health and welfare, as if that was always there. We fought for that. And what was interesting, too, is that the writers who fought and went on strike for it were a lot of them writers who did, who, uh, and, and for minimums, who went on strike to raise minimums and all that, were writers who didn't need those minimums. They were the top writers who were making good money and all that, but they felt that it was an obligation to their to the guild and to the, the labor uh, labor union and all that to do that and so a lot of time when i hear young new writers say to me well what can the guild what does the guild mean to me i hear this a lot or well, you know the guild doesn't represent me really i say it doesn't how do you think you got all the things that you have that you take for granted it's because of all the years that this guild fought for it, went on strike for it, and that's, that's been a gift to you. Uh, anyway, I think the Guild is terrific. I say it's the gutsiest Guild in Hollywood because it's gone on strike more than any other Guild. <laughs> but I think I like writing for screen, I mean cinema, the best. I'll tell you why. I loved writing in the theater because uh, you supposedly have more freedom you own the work. You could close the show down if you don't like it, so anyone who would do that and put all those people out of work would be awful. But, but you really, the writer is the owner of that material. You own it, you do it, you, it's yours. But, and I like that, but you're confined, not so much today or a few years ago, but when I first started, you're confined by the proscenium. You know, there were, you, would, you would have to bring people indoors and then out of doors. How do I get him off the stage? How do I get her on the stage? How do I bring this one in? How do I? It just seemed to me very confining. Now, of course, the, uh, theater, you, you have a chair and a table and you're in, uh, in Bosnia. And then you, you, you put the lights over here and you're somewhere else. It's very cinematic. But then it wasn't. Then the movies, when I wrote my first movie, I didn't have to worry about bringing people in and out of doors. You just cut. You were in another scene. It was so freeing. I just loved it. And I like, too, that in the theater, 
you are always one thing wonderful you're among people you are sharing the experience but you always know you're in a theater and you're having a wonderful experience but it's you it's the audience and the stage relating in the movies you if you have a good movie you're in the movie you really uh, forget you're in a theater it's 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 a whole different experience and i love that i do love that people had more fun making movies when i came into movies they really did not that there weren't disappointments and there were lots of things that were not as you would have wanted them and there were uh, and the the heads of the studios were not great noble men they wanted to make a buck like everybody else but they did love making movies they they were movie makers whatever uh, you would say and everyone felt very fortunate being a uh, part of movie making it was great fun i don't find that today i don't find people find fun in making movies as much today there's too much of the of of the bottom line the necessity to make it to for in the networks to or in the uh, in television to have ratings in big screen to have that picture that opens big uh, and the, the the newspapers contribute to that because every day i read i just read today uh, Oh audience is love uh, deep impact it's a second week of this 21 million dollars that should not be what the newspapers are telling us that that it, that it was big box office you shouldn't go because it's big box office you should go cuz it's a movie you want to see at least <laughs> i think so the motivating force in movie making today except for the the really people who are still left who love movies or the new young ones coming up who love movies is making money uh and making movies is more fun than making money <laughs> at least that's my theory <laughs> i look at some of the great old movies that were as sexy as they could be and they allowed you they brought you to a certain point and they allowed your imagination to work and your imagination could do much better than anyone can do doing the huffing and puffing so i i think now it's like it's almost mandatory i have a feeling that there sometimes they get a direction saying oh i think you better put a sex scene in you know for the audience or you i love the things they that i'm told they now say you need an edge that's my favorite word the script needs an edge it needs a little more violence the script needs this and then they get a writer maybe that's what's different you to ask me earlier what's different they get a writer to put in the edge not to rewrite the script to put the edge in to put a little violence in or well the dialogue needs pumping up well, and let's have somebody come in and polish it it's and just going to polish well it. they almost don't even they 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 pick a particular aspect and i had a producer friend of mine tell me that that's the way it goes and that you bring in a writer very often for $500,000 maybe for a few weeks $250,000 or whatever to give it the edge and i see more movies that i i keep saying it's going off it it's and that's because some other hand is on there putting in something that is not of a piece with the movie it's run by by businesses now you know seagram's runs one and uh, you know it's not run by for all you say louis mayer was not the king of the world in terms of being a wonderful human being he did love making movies and i'm not sure they don't like making money oh it occurs to me i ought to tell you you said what was the uh, thing about when i want to give up the job quite often uh, not not very often but some not often enough i would go and i would get started on a project and i would get this would be not an original and add up something that that was an assignment i would get some money to start 
and I would start, you know, do all my delaying tactics and everything, but mm -hmm. finally I would get to do it, and I would get about a quarter of the way through, and I would find that I'm not getting enough of those great points. I'm not feeling good. I'm not, I don't want to go to work tomorrow. I don't want to, and I would call up my agent. At that time it was Sylvia uh, uh, at the William Morris Agency, and I would say, Sylvia, I want to give this project up. I want to give them back the start money. I want to give the project up. She had this tone of voice. I can hear it now. I see her still. I, she's my friend. And uh, she would say, Faye, why don't you take a few days and go to Palm Springs? <laughs> It was the way of saying, you really need a rest, kid. You need a separation. And I would say, well, Sylvia, it's not going to, well, just do that. Let's re and so I would do that. And of course, the mind would be working. I'd go to Palm Springs, Michael and I would, and the mind would be working. By the time I got back, I'd be back on the assignment. But I once told that to Garson, and he said, never give back the money. <laughs> I love that. He said, you never give back the money. <laughs> I think success is um, feeling good about your life. I look back on my life uh, quite often. Michael and I used to do that. And we would say, Aren't, haven't we been lucky? Maybe lucky isn't the word, but uh, in a way it is lucky. We have really had a good life. We early on worked in a field that we both enjoyed enormously. We had a very good measure of success. We had some failures, some disappointments, but that's part of life. We had each other. We had two kids. The only bad thing in my life is I did lose one child. I lost my older son at 13 to cancer. And that is probably the worst thing that can happen to a parent is to lose a child. Aside from that, I think I've had a really marvelous life, and I consider that success. <laughs> this is a verse Michael wrote to uh, celebrate my writing habits. He called it Faye's Sin. Writing is something one has to admire. The art and the craft are a constant delight. How great for the ego to sway, to inspire. The fly in the ointment is having to write. Creating a manuscript, even a stinker, requires an effort that boggles the mind. My God, all that sitting like Rodin's The Thinker can seriously damage your brain and behind. For 30 odd years in this noble profession, I've harbored a guilt and my conscience is smitten. So here's my rather embarrassed confession. I don't like to write, but I love to have written. <laughs>